I appreciate the chance to spend some time with you this morning and most especially for the excuse to come back to such a beautiful place. I grew up at the edge of the redwoods and the ocean and I think of that as God's, God's country. This might be his holiday place. <laughs> this is just absolutely beautiful. So uh, thank you for the excuse to come back. I want to start off talking just a little bit about what a friend of mine calls the curious paradox of Indian child welfare. And by that she talks about it on a couple of different levels. But the first one is that if you look at some of the writings, some of the diaries of the early explorers to this continent, they write in great detail about the loving, caring way that Indian families and Indian communities take care of children. And one thing that's odd about that, if you remember that these are not anthropologists who are going out to describe what life is like. These are people who are struck by something so different than what they come from. Do you remember the time that those early explorers, what was going on where they came from? From Western Europe. That was the Industrial Revolution. That's where children were commodities. Children were sources of capital, of labor. What struck them so different when they arrived here was that children were loved and taken care of and warmly embraced, not looked at as a source of labor or capital. What's happened since then? Why is it that Indian communities and Indian families aren't still looked at that way? That, I think, is what Margaret was talking about with the curious paradox. What's happened that when first contact happened, Indian families were viewed as so warm and so loving, so embracing, to today? Well, to answer that question, I'm going to give you a little bit of history about the context for Indian child welfare efforts. So to answer the question, everyone wants what's best for the child. Why is there an Indian Child Welfare Act? Another way to put that is why trust is not automatic when somebody says, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> or to put it another way, trust us, we know what's best for your children. I'm going to start off with the BIA boarding schools. And this is a picture of an early BIA boarding school. And you can clearly see the soldier with his rifle. Behind him the slide is washed out, but there's a barbed wire fence. In the background you can see girls in dresses. Now that soldier with his rifle and the barbed wire fence are not there to keep terrorists out. It's there to keep the kids in. That this was not a voluntary process. The BIA started off as a part of the War Department. And education was seen as a part of the civilizing function, part of the solution to the Indian problem. And there started after the Civil War. There was a place in Virginia called the Hampton Institute, which is the predecessor for one of the famous black colleges, Hampton. Hampton was created after the Civil War because people were afraid that slaves who had been freed by the Emancipation Proclamation, by uh, amendments to the Constitution, were going to resort to crime. Now a man by the name of Colonel Pratt came across that Hampton Institute and said, you know, if that works for freed slaves, maybe it would work for Indians. So they brought a group of adult Indian males to the Hampton Institute to try it out. After a few months they decided, in fact, this was not going to work. 
So they got together and started talking about, well, what do we need to do to make it work? And they came to the conclusion that they just needed to start earlier. So they decided to bring children. And some of those children, when they grew up, wrote down an account of what happened. And essentially, the cavalry gathered families together at the fort, separated the children from the adults, and they moved the children onto the trains with no adult who spoke their language. Nobody who could tell those kids what was going on, why they were being separated from their families. The trains began to fill with smoke and with the sound of metal grinding on metal, the trains took off. Three days and three nights these children were on that train, not knowing where they were going, why they were going, what was waiting for them at the end, if it would ever end. <laughs> They got to the Hampton Institute and they took pictures and you could see that they were, were poorly dressed and they were clearly afraid. Several months later, Colonel Pratt and his colleagues deemed that experiment a success. And the following year, the Carlisle Indian School was founded as the first of the BIA boarding schools. Now, I hope you appreciate the irony of, of these children who are marching around like little West Point cadets when their families, their parents and their grandparents literally a handful of years before were fighting the cavalry. They're now little military school cadets. <coughs> Carlisle was founded as a military boarding school. <coughs> Carlisle is now the home of the U.S. Army War College. And one of the things that they did when they created the Army War College is they moved the cemetery for the boarding school away. Because one of the hallmarks for these boarding schools for the first 30 years they were in existence were the cemeteries that were attached to them. Because over half of the children who went to those schools died at those schools. Education was not a voluntary part of the process. See the man on the top right with the star? His job was to chase down the runaways. Now even if you thought it was a good idea to send your kids to a school like this, if you knew there was a 50-50 chance they'd come back alive, would you send them? Probably not. So by 1890, the government had to enforce sending kids to these boarding schools. So tribes were guaranteed by treaty land. Oftentimes they were restricted, so they didn't have weapons, so they couldn't hunt. So they were entirely dependent on the federal government for food, for clothes, for shelter. 1890, the federal government started to tell those tribes, unless you're willing to send your kids to these schools, you don't get that food, you don't get those blankets, you don't get that shelter. So parents are faced with the choice of, do I send my kids to school, or do I let my family starve or freeze to death? Now, when I first started learning about these schools, I assumed that they were for older kids, older meaning 12, 13, 14. Turns out they were as young as four. This is from the Haskell Indian School Museum. Look at the size of those handcuffs. What kind of a mindset do you need to think that you need handcuffs of that size? The early approved curricula for these schools actually prohibited teaching and reading and writing, not unlike the laws that dealt with slaves. Now in my more cynical moments, I think I understand why they prohibited teaching, reading, and writing. How much easier is it to get somebody to sign a document if they don't know what's in there? <laughs> 
when the tribes signed treaties, they had to depend upon the other side to tell them what was in there that they were signing. Until about 30 years ago, the Supreme Court has a, had as a canon of construction, which just means a rule for interpreting and applying treaties. Their canon of construction for applying Indian treaties was that the treaties should be applied as the Indians would have understood them. In the last 30 years, the Supreme Court has moved away from that to where treaties are to be interpreted as they are written, whether or not the tribes could have understood them at the time. That to me makes sense why they would not want to teach reading and writing. Because it's easier to get somebody to sign a document if they have to trust the other side about what's in there. So the, instead of teaching reading and writing, the early curriculum taught people to be laborers, seamstresses, cleaning women, laborers. Now what those schools did do though was they were able to succeed in breaking down the intergenerational teaching and training and raising of children that happened in Indian communities. In most Indian communities, it was not just the parents who are responsible for raising and instructing and teaching children. It was the grandparents, it was the aunts and uncles, it was the elders, it was the religious leaders, it was the society and clan leaders. They all had a role. Now with the advent of boarding schools, you break that down. You ended up with some of the very things that Maylin were talking about was talking about this morning. Language, religious practices, cultural knowledge were all specifically targeted. So we ended up with whole generations that learned to be parents from the dormitories. Now what's the hallmark of a good employee when they have personal problems? You don't bring your personal problems to work, right? You stay home when you take care of those problems and then you come back to work. But what does that mean for these children who then grow up never seeing an adult struggle with a problem and overcome it? What they see or that when people have problems, they disappear. I think that that's no small part of why in our communities we see so many people disappear into a bottle, or sometimes literally, when they have problems. If you've never seen an adult struggle and overcome a problem, how do you know that it's even possible, much less how to do it? So we have generation after generation after generation raised in these boarding schools. Now if we were going to intentionally create a system to create dysfunctional families, this might be a candidate of what we would do. We would take kids away from their families, away from their communities, away from their value system, away from their language, and we would raise them in dormitories. Now this didn't just happen here. This also happened in Canada, except in Canada they were called residential schools. But it didn't just happen on this continent. For those of you who like movies, take a look at the movie Rabbit Proof Fence. It's probably 10 years old now. It's the story of a couple of young Aboriginal girls who run away from the school trying to get home and they go over a thousand miles trying to get there. And understand that these boarding schools are not just history of 130, 140 years ago. I have colleagues my age who had their mouths washed out with soap for speaking their tribal language in their free time outside of class. The goal 
quite literally, as spelled out in the early documents, was to kill the Indian and save the child. Some of the welcoming speeches have been recorded, written down, that the school superintendents used when the children arrived at the school. And some of the opening words are, let all that is Indian within you die. Etched into the archways, carved into the archways, tradition is the enemy of progress. The goal was to strip away that Indian identity and leave essentially a brown-skinned white person behind. So let's jump to 50 years ago. 1958 Indian Adoption Project was a joint effort of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Child Welfare League of America. Now in the 1950s and 60s, CWLA was the cutting edge thinking on what good child rearing practices looked like. They were the go-to people on what good child rearing ought to be. They got together with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and created the Indian Adoption Project. And the project had as its goal the placement of Indian children in, quote, suitable homes. Now what happened was states were actually being paid by the Bureau of Indian Affairs to remove Indian children from their families using the rubric of neglect. And transracial placements were encouraged because the goal was to get those Indian kids away from their Indian families and culture so that they, quote, could have a chance at life in a modern world. During this time period, 25 to 35 percent of all Indian kids in the country were removed from their families. And how do we know about this process? Well, CWLA has since issued a written apology, and they've opened up their files where people can go in and look and see what happened. So let's jump to 30 years ago. It used to be that people who wanted to do research on third world people and not have to leave hot showers and fast food would choose to do their research on Indian communities. Until tribal leaders started to say no, because what was happening are that the researchers would come in and do their work and they would leave and they'd write the report and it would sit in some university bookshelf somewhere. <coughs> so tribal leaders started to say no unless as part of your research design, you come back and share with us what you learned and help us figure out how to do better for our communities. So one of the last comprehensive looks at life in Indian country was done by the US Congress in the mid-1970s. And they created the American Indian Policy Review Commission. And they looked at life across many different strata in Indian country. But one of the areas they looked at were families and children. And let me share with you what they found. They looked at the foster care and adoption rates by state. And the state rates vary from each other. So each state, they baselined that state rate and pegged that at one. They counted Indian kids. They counted all kids in the state to set that state level. And then they broke out the Indian kids to set that at a different level to find out what the comparison was. So in Arizona, they found that Indian children were 420 percent more likely to be adopted than non-Indian children, 270 percent more likely to be in foster care. In California, 840 percent more likely to be adopted, 270 percent more likely to be in foster care. In Michigan, 370 percent more likely to be adopted, over 700 percent more likely to be in foster care. Minnesota, almost 400 percent more likely to be adopted, 1,650 percent more likely to be in foster care. Montana, almost 500 percent more likely to be adopted, almost 1,300 percent more likely to be in foster care. North Dakota, almost 300 percent more likely to be adopted, 
over 2,000 percent more likely to be in foster care. Utah, the state that I'm living in now, 340 percent more likely to be adopted. 1,500 percent more likely to be in foster care. Washington State, 1,900 percent more likely to be adopted. Almost 1,000 percent more likely to be in foster care. This is from the mid-1970s and that report was issued in 1977. The next year, ICWA was adopted. People had been asking for ICWA, had been lobbying for ICWA. On the basis of this report, ICWA passed Congress with only a handful of votes dissenting. But interestingly, and this is why the, the old BIA guidelines are what they are, the BIA actually testified against the passage of ICWA. The BIA at that point was still into the paternalism of, we know what's best for you. We'll tell you what to do with your children. ICWA was a break with that. ICWA said the communities ought to have the responsibility, both the good and the bad, for taking care of their kids. So of course with the passage of ICWA, everything's fixed, right? Everything is all better? No problems? Well, the Government Accountability Office issued a response to Congressman Rangel who was asking about the rates that minority children were in foster care. The report focused primarily on African Americans, but they also included the numbers for Indian people. So let me share with you in 2007 what the Government Accountability Office reported to Congress. And again, pegging the state rates at one, Colorado was almost twice as many Indian kids in care. And the number off to the right is the placement rate for Caucasian children, just as a baseline. North Dakota, they were three times more likely to be in foster care. Utah, four times more likely. Washington State, five times more likely. Iowa, five and a half. Nebraska, six and a half. Minnesota, over seven. And Oregon was at an eight and a half. Now the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges wanted to find out, is it getting better or worse? And so they took a snapshot from 2004 and compared it to 2009. Some states were getting better and some weren't. South Dakota was going up. Nevada tripled. Idaho is up to six and a half. Washington State's almost seven. Montana went up to almost four times. Minnesota went up to an 11 and a half. And I was at a conference in Minnesota last year where the Minnesota Chief Justice of their Supreme Court acknowledged that their Indian placement rate was now over 14 times that of any other group in the state. And the thing about these numbers, these numbers are underreported because they're based on AFCARS, which is the data reported by the federal, to the federal government by the states. So this does not count the kids who are in tribal custody. This counts only the kids in state custody. So how does that happen? How do we end up with numbers like this? I'm not one of these people who think that racism is responsible for everything. I happen to think this is the result of people who mean well and don't understand. And I'm going to try and explain that to you. Uh, with an exercise. 
This is called mind the little things. Springs are little things, but they're sources of large streams. Nails and pegs are little things, but they hold the parts of a large building together. A word, a look, a smile, a frown are all little things, but powerful for good or evil. Think of this and mind the little things. When I used to do training for our new judges in the state of Utah, I would use this as a way of trying to get those judges to understand that when they put on that black robe and they sit up on that bench, everything they do gets magnified. If you smile during trial, people think they're winning. If you frown during trial, people think they're losing. If you close your eyes for just a moment, they're convinced you were asleep. But I want to use this for a different purpose. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it back on the screen, but I would like you to count the number of Fs that are in that statement. But I want you to do this the way that you took a test when you were in school. In other words, without reference to your neighbor. <laughs> Keep your own score quietly. So please count the number of times the letter F shows up. Mind the little things. Springs are little things, but they're sources of large streams. Nails and pegs are little things, but they hold the parts of a large building together. A word, a look, a smile, a frown are all little things, but powerful for good or evil. Think of this and mind the little things. Okay. Those who saw between zero and three Fs, please stand up for me. Look around the room. Those who saw four, join them. And look around. Those who saw five, join them. And look around. that make those of you still seated worry a little bit? <laughs> those who saw six join them. And more than six. Okay, have a seat. Thank you for humoring me. <laughs> there are, in fact, six. The first three are not particularly difficult. Frown. Powerful and four. The next three, though, are more problematic. Of. Of. And of. So why is it so hard to see all six? Anybody? Any ideas? They are little things. That's certainly one. Yes. I was going to say, you obviously have studied language. And I'm going to take that as the correct answer and pretend I'm Alex Trebek and I really know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but the answer is, what does the F and of sound like? It sounds like a V. So even though we see an F, we hear a V. Most of us learn to read with phonetics by sounding out the word. So even though we see an F, we hear a V. Something as simple and objective as counting Fs is influenced by our early learning. Well, let me suggest that that same kind of early learning, what we expect to see, influences our decisions about child welfare. Two thirds of the kids who are in care are not there for sexual abuse and not there for physical abuse. They're there because of neglect. Because somebody didn't think that family was good enough. Now what happens if my view of what's good enough is different than yours? Let me give you an example. <coughs> Next Monday, 
You get to your office. There's a message that says, call the White House in Washington, D.C. And once you figure out that somebody's not pranking you, and it's, as my grandson says, for reals, <laughs> you call. And you find out that in an effort to divert attention away from problems all over the world, they're opening a new initiative to mainland China. And they're going to create a model child welfare program. And they're going to give you a chance to go participate in that program and take your kids or your grandkids with you, all at government expense for six months. So let's assume you decide to take them up on that offer and you go. But when you get there, they don't put you in Beijing or one of the big cities. They put you in one of the little communities way out in the sticks. And then let's assume that two weeks after you're there, you're in a car accident. You end up in the hospital. The embassy is no place around. They can't take your kids. So the kids or your grandkids go into the Chinese welfare system. And then let's assume you get out the very next day. But now you've run into the Chinese version of our bureaucrat. And before they return those kids to you, they want to make sure you're an appropriate person to take care of those kids. So they want to do an assessment. So they conduct the assessment. Do you think you feed your kids appropriately by mainland Chinese standards? Do you clothe them appropriately? Do you teach them a sense of responsibility and right from wrong that they would consider appropriate? Do you discipline them appropriately? Do you show them affection appropriately? Would you even know how to fake it? Let me suggest that when you start judging families across cultural lines, our own values, and for good reason, they're our values, may not fit that other family because they have a different experience. So if we saw all those numbers so out of line, why isn't the solution, let's just do it better? Let's just pay more attention to what we're doing. Wouldn't that solve the problem? We're just more mindful about child welfare. Well, let me answer that by talking first about the impact of removal on all children and then on Indian children. Thank you. So currently, in our nationwide child welfare system, there are 420,000 kids in foster care today. It's down from a half million a few years ago. 800,000 children will be in care sometime this year. Now, that's twice the number from the 1980s. And the average child spends two years in care and goes through three different placements. And 20% of the kids spend over five years in foster care. But foster care creates its own problems. What happens when children grow up without families that they can count on? Well, the Casey Family Programs did a survey a few years ago of alumni from foster care in the Northwest. And let me share with you what they found, some of the numbers. The average age of the person taking the survey was 24 years old, so they had been out of care for several years. They found that the mean length of time in care was six years. They averaged almost one and a half placement changes per year. 65% experienced seven or more school placement changes. They completed the high school at the same rate as other kids, but they utilized a GED six times more often to get to that completion rate. Fewer than 2% of children who have ever spent a single day in foster care have gone on to complete a college degree. 
Within 12 months of the study, over half were diagnosed with major mental health disorders. 25% with PTSD. That's twice the rate of Vietnam vets and Afghanistan and Iraq vets. And if you think about it, that makes some sense. What was the hallmark of PTSD for those vets? Never knowing who the enemy was, never knowing when you were safe, never being able to fully let down your guard, not being appreciated, not being welcomed. That's very much the story the kids in foster care tell. Shouldn't surprise us that a quarter were suffering from PTSD. 20% were depressed, had a major depression. 17% with a social phobia. They had a higher unemployment rate. 17% were on public assistance. A third were below the poverty line. And a third had no health insurance. And that's if they had ever spent a day in foster care. Now, when I started as a judge 36 years ago, our goal was to get kids to 18. We figured if we could get them to 18, that was success. Well, I'm not so sure about that anymore. 23,000 kids are going to age out of foster care in this country today. And this is not a bubble. It has been plus or minus 2,000 for that for about 15 years. Now, what happens to kids who age out of foster care? Well, that carries some risks. I'd like to think that when I was 17 and 18, I could make good decisions for myself. I didn't need to hear from other people. I'm so lucky I had other people. Even if I didn't want to listen to them, I knew they cared. And sometimes I did listen, even if I didn't want to acknowledge it. What happens when you don't have that? How do you learn from your own mistakes if you don't have somebody helping you? When I served on the Pew Commission on Children in Foster Care about 10 years ago, we listened not just to the experts, but to kids. And one, I remember very clearly one young man saying, I tried and I messed up. And I tried and I messed up and I tried and I figured, why bother? I'm just a screw up. If you don't have somebody helping you learn, how do you have the courage to keep going? Without your own cheerleaders to celebrate your successes, how do you continue? When life knocks you down and there's no one to pick you up, how many times can you get up on your own before you stop? Well, one expert came to us and told us that of the 23,000 kids who will age out of foster care, 60%, over 60% of those kids will be homeless, in jail, or dead within two years. Now, when I started 36 years ago, the goal was to get kids to 18, and I thought that was success. I'm not sure this is success. And in quiet moments and the darkest part of the night, I have to wonder if we had done nothing to those kids, would they have been worse? But you know what, what breaks that number? Relationships. People who care about you. And if the child knows cares about them. Safety is not enough. Safety is essential. Safety is important, but it's not as sufficient. We should have learned that lesson when the Iron Curtain fell in Eastern Europe and those orphanages. You know those orphanages where the kids are safe, they're fed, they're taken care of, and they're handled about 15 or 20 minutes out of the day? They found out that those children's brains are about two-thirds of the size of normal children. The brain just didn't grow. Safety's not enough. It's important, but it's not enough. But relationships can make that difference. And just as an update, 
One of the boards that I serve on, WestEd, published a bulletin in 2012. And they found out that for kids aging out of foster care, within two to four years, 51% were unemployed, 25% <coughs> were homeless, and 20% were incarcerated. Now let me give you some information on what science is telling us now about the impact on kids. Dr. Ross Thompson uh, is one of these people who plays with multi-million dollar machines that takes pictures of kids' brains as they're doing different things. And he's part of the National Scientific Council on Developing Child. And I had the fortunate opportunity to be in a very small session where he did a presentation on this. So let me summarize for you what he was talking about. He said that there are certain brain keys. And one of those is that the brains are built over time. And they're done in layers. So that there are time periods when the brain grows more. And there are two time periods when the brain grows the fastest. And I'm assuming because you're all child welfare professionals, you know what those two time periods are. Zero to five and teenage years. The brain grows faster than any other time. And they build from the circuits, bottom up. When I was in school, there was a debate which is more important, nature or nurture, genetics or environment. Turns out that scientists are now saying it's the dance of the two. They interact with each other. One by itself doesn't control, and one by itself doesn't trump. But it's the interaction of environment and genetics. So genes determine when the brain's going to grow for any individual child. Environment will determine how it grows and if it grows. So you're all familiar with People who have a newborn infant, people go over and visit, and we all make these stupid faces and these silly sounds right in the child's face. And the child smiles, and we smile, and they make a noise, and we make a noise, and that just seems to be part of a ritual. Turns out that is exactly what's necessary for kids' brains to grow. It's that serve and volley, that back and forth, that's essential. The brain literally will not grow without that. It's that back and forth, that mutually interactive. So it's not plopping the kids in front of the TV. It's that interaction back and forth that makes the brains grow. It's that serve and volley, serve and return. Abilities are built from the bottom up. The brain is sort of like a circuit board or paint or varnish. Each layer adds new complexity. But you need those layers of increasing complexity so that you can do tasks. They're intertwined. There's not one layer that says that you can talk. There's not one layer that says you know how to love. There's not one layer that says you know how to communicate. It's the interaction of all of those things. So for example, oral language depends on adequate hearing, the ability to differentiate sounds, the capacity to link meaning to specific words, then the ability to concentrate, pay attention, engage in interaction. All of those things come about with different layers of the brains, but they're all necessary. Now, one of the things that they've discovered, though, is that there is something that will prevent the brain from growing. That's cortisol. When a child's brain is flooded with cortisol, it literally will not grow that next layer of brain growth. And that next layer of brain growth will never be made up if it doesn't grow at that time. Now, you can train around it, but it's like training a stroke victim. It's hard work. It has to be intentional. And that person is never as easily accessible as before the stroke. So that cortisol is what most of us think of as adrenaline. When our face gets flush, we hear the blood pounding in our ears. And in really stressful situations, things slow way down. 
don't know about you, but when I've been in a car accident and it's like I can see it coming, it's unfolding in slow motion and there's not a thing I can do about it, my body's being flooded with cortisol. When a child's body is flooded with cortisol, that layer of brain won't grow. So wouldn't you think that's something we ought to be keeping track of? It's easy to do. It's just a cheek swab. Does anybody do that for the kids? From when you take them into care to when you're making decisions for them to see if they're doing any better? It's easy to do. But that cortisol ends up damaging the brain architecture and then that has consequences that are lifelong. Not just mental health issues, but physical health issues that are lifelong. Now there is positive stress. Short term, moderate. When junior high girl is playing in a basketball tournament, she's playing in the finals. Three seconds to go, she has two free throws and her team is down by one. She's standing on that free throw line. She's under stress. But win or lose, she's going to be surrounded by her friends and family and teammates who will say, we knew you could do it, or next time we'll get them. But she's not going through it alone. There are people she knows care about her who are there for her. That's the short-term stress that actually is essential for kids so that they develop some sense of mastery, some sense of control, some sense of the ability to deal with pressure when life throws that at them. That kind of stress is positive. It's important that the child experience that and have a chance to grow and learn from that. Then there's the tolerable stress. And that's the stress that's capable of disrupting the brain architecture. But it's relieved by the supportive relationships that facilitate adaptive coping. And that brings that cortisol level down. It's the supportive adult that provides that child that, <coughs> that lowering. And what makes it toxic, excuse me, non-normative experiences. This is from the American Academy of Pediatrics, their technical bulletin, 2012. Non-normative experiences that present a greater magnitude of adversity or threat, such as the death of a family member, serious illness or injury, contentious divorce, a natural disaster, an act of terrorism, and I've heard some of the experts explain removal. That is all a traumatic situation for that child. What makes stress toxic is that same level in the absence of consistent supportive relationships. It's those relationships that buffer that child. Let me give you an example. When I was on the Pew Commission for Children in Foster Care, we made a series of national recommendations. One of those recommendations was that judges climb down out of their ivory tower and meet with service providers, with system administrators, with lawyers about how to improve the working of the child welfare system. So I made a presentation like that to a group of judges in my state. They said, yep, that sounds good. We're going to do that. A year later, they invited me back to watch because they were justifiably proud that they were around the tables, the judges, the system administrators, the service providers, attorneys. And they wanted to show off, so they invited me to come back. And if I'd had any hair left, I would have pulled it out over what they were talking about. Because they were all in agreement. The case they were talking about was 2 o'clock on a Saturday morning, mom gets arrested. The police show up at the house, they haul her away, the lights are flashing and she's hauled away in handcuffs. 
She has a seven-year-old, a five-year-old, and a three-year-old. And they're mad at the police officer because grandma lived around the block. And he let those kids go home with grandma. They're mad at him because they thought those kids should have been put in a shelter. Why? Because for e-money, one of the requirements is the first official placement has to be a licensed home or those children will not be eligible for 4 e money. They were worried that with a police officer making a decision that was not voluntary to mom, that would be considered an official placement and those children would not be eligible for 4 e money, which is the money the federal government contributes to the state. And I had to ex explain to them that from my outsider's view, I think they had lost their way. What's more important, the money or the kids? Now clearly we need the money to provide better services and assistance, but when it comes down to it, what's more important? They eventually did all the background checks on grandma. She was perfect, no problems. She was given a license. The kids stayed with her eventually. About a month later, is what the timing would have been before all the licensing was completed. But I had to ask them, okay, if the money is so important, why not make arrangements to set up a cot in the shelter so that grandma can sleep in the same room with them? Because it's that presence of grandma who brings that level, that cortisol level down, somebody they know and trust. The American Academy of Pediatrics the risk is greatly reduced to the extent to which protective adult relationships facilitate, not provide, facilitate the child's adaptive coping. So it's not safety, it's the child's adaptive coping and a sense of control that reduces that, that brings that cortisol level down. So if they go home with grandma at 2 in the morning, the five-year-olds, when they get to grandma's house, can I have a cookie? Grandma says, no, it's bedtime, it's late, you need to go to bed. Grandma, can I have a cookie? Please, can I have a cookie? Grandma, I need a cookie. Eventually, grandma gives in and gives them a cookie. Now, is that life and death? No. But what that is, is a sense of control for that child, that they have a voice that there's somebody in charge who's listening. If they had gone to the shelter, what are the chances that if they wanted a cookie, they would have been given one? And again, it's not life and death, but it's that sense of adaptive coping and giving the child some sense that they have something in their life that's under control. So when grandma puts their arm around them and says, it'll be okay. Do any of us really believe it's going to be okay? But the child can believe it's okay because they know grandma, they trust grandma, and they can let their vigilance drop, their cortisol level drop, and go back to being a kid with somebody who cares about them in charge. That brings the cortisol level down. So I asked Dr. Thompson, what his research suggested about our child welfare system. And his response was, it's contraindicated. Now when he said that, I wanted to pretend like I knew what that meant. I mean, clearly it's not good. So I eventually got home and I asked a medical professional that I know, what does contraindicated mean? I know it's not a good thing. He said, well, it actually means actively bad. that what we do to our kids is we remove them even if removal is necessary. We put them with strangers. How likely is that to lower their cortisol level? How likely is that to get that down? And how much of a priority is it to find somebody who has a relationship with those kids that can bring that down? Or is our concern simply they're safe? Well, let me talk to you just a little bit about the impact of removal on Indian children in particular. Because up to now I've been talking about the impact on all children. 
Dr. Samuel Roll, who is a clinical and a research psychologist uh, working at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. He and his colleagues have come up with what they call identification with the aggressor. And that's, let me give an example of what that, what identification with the aggressor is. When I grew up, I loved watching westerns. That's when they knew how to make westerns. The music, the storyline, the clothes, all told you who the good guy was. There were no heroes with clay feet. The heroes were the heroes, and the bad guys were the bad guys, and the heroes always won. So I liked westerns. It was predictable. But I can remember watching a western when I was about 11 or 12 in my family's home in Northern California on a Saturday <laughs> afternoon, when all of a sudden I realized that I was rooting for the cavalry to shoot people like me. That's identification with the aggressor. That I have more in common with the bad guys than the good guys. That was one of those experiences that rocked me right down to the soles of my feet. Well, Dr. Roll and his colleagues used a thematic apperception test. And that's just fancy jargon for they told a story. And they changed one variable in the story to measure the impact of that variable. So they told a story about Johnny. And in that story, Everybody identified Johnny at the good end of the spectrum when Johnny was not identified. But when Johnny was identified as Indian, there was one group that ranked Johnny at the bad end of the spectrum. The only difference in the story was he was identified as Indian. That was among Indian kids being raised in non-Indian homes. When the story was about Mary, everybody ranked Mary as beautiful when she was not identified. But when she was identified as Indian, Indian kids in non-Indian homes ranked Mary as ugly. When the story was about Tommy, everybody ranked Tommy as smart, except when he was identified as Indian. The Indian kids raised in non-Indian homes marked him as dumb. And the same thing with honest and dishonest. The scary part? Kids as young as four were drawing these distinctions. Now I'm going to piggyback a little bit on what Maylin talked about this morning, but I'm also going to disagree a little bit just because I don't know where her numbers and my numbers are match and are off a little bit. But take as a baseline the teenage suicide rate in this country. I mean, the tragedy of teenage suicide is that's when most kids think they're bulletproof, when there are no consequences for the choices they make, when there are no limits to what they can do. So start with the tragedy of teenage suicide. It's higher in the inner cities. It's higher than that on reservations. And appears to be highest of all among Indian kids raised in non Indian homes. And that's just the tip of the iceberg for mental health issues. So if we look at child welfare, Western science, Dr. Thompson, tribal traditions of child care all agree on the importance of relationships. That relationships are essential. That safety is not enough. It's a necessary, but it's not a sufficient. If we stop the inquiry at safety, we have not served the kids. There has been, again, research on some children seem to survive the very worst physical abuse, the very worst sexual abuse, and come out seemingly whole at the back end of that. The trait that they experience in common has been labeled resilience. 
But we know what builds resilience now. We can't protect the kids from the world. We would like to, and please understand, I'm not saying we shouldn't try. But we cannot protect the kids from the world. Unless we're going to put them in a plastic bubble and let no one interact with them or touch them or speak with them. Clearly that's not going to work for a whole lot of reasons. But we can equip them to survive whatever the world throws at them, and that's building resilience. We know what builds resilience. It's relationships. It's the fact the child is not alone. Even if they're alone at that moment in time, they know they're not alone. There are people who, if they knew what was happening, would help. There are people who want them to succeed, who will do whatever they can. Those relationships are what protect the children. And it's the absence of those relationships that I think accounts for the fact that by the time I was done with my career as a judge, I had been seeing second and third and fourth generation kids in foster care. Because we didn't heal their parents and their grandparents when we had them in the system. Sort of like, remember those boarding school kids? If you haven't been in a loving family, how do you know how to be a loving parent? Well, you can be coached and taught, certainly better than nothing. But how often do we coach and teach and heal those kids when we have them in our system? Or do we simply say, you're 18, we succeeded? Or we could be building those relationships. And that's what ICWA really is, is about preserving or rebuilding the connections that are necessary for our children to be good parents when it's their turn. So when I started as a judge 36 years ago, my goal was to get them to 18. Partway along that career, I changed my goal and said, OK, we need to get them educated. I still think that's the wrong goal. I think the goal is our goal should be getting them to where they become parents, they will be good parents. That's how we break the cycle. What's the layman's definition of insanity? You do the same thing over and over and hope for a different result? Well, let me suggest to you that hope is not a strategy. And someday is not a plan. So why not consider doing things differently? That's what ICWA was about. That's what the idea of ICWA, to, ICWA as a gold standard is about, of healing children who are in need so that they can be good parents when it's their turn. So we can break this cycle of second and third and fourth generation kids in foster care. Turn the world upside down. Do something different. Now, I, when I was growing up, I loved to collect quotes, and this is one that I've actually managed to hang on to. The test of the morality of a society is what it does for its children. If we warehouse our children, what does that say about us? Whether we warehouse them in boarding schools, or we warehouse them in group care institutions, or into a, a family that's being paid to take care of them. And understand, I acknowledge there are saints who are foster parents. And there are also non-saints. But the perspective of the child is, in either home, they're taking care of me because they're being paid to. That's a different perspective than, these people love me. They have their flaws, but they love me. For me, not because somebody's paying them to. 
I wish I had known that when I started my career as a judge 36 years ago. I wish before they let me put on that black robe and make decisions for children and families, they'd force me to sit down and talk to some of the kids in the system and hear from their perspective what it was like and what they were missing and what they needed because I would have been a very different judge. I made mistakes because I trusted that the system knew what was best for those children. I know better now. And that's why I do these talks anywhere I'm invited, because I need you to redeem my mistakes. I need you to do better than I did. It took me a career to know enough to know I had been doing it wrong. So please redeem my mistakes for me with the children that you work with. Over 50 years ago, President Kennedy said these things on the 50th anniversary of the Children's Bureau. We shall not have fulfilled our obligation as a people unless our children, regardless of the circumstances of their birth, have the opportunity to grow to wholesome, self-sustaining adulthood and make something of their lives. 50 years ago, we went to the moon sooner than that. We owe those children. They are our children. If we're not going to do for them what we would want done for our own, how can we look ourselves in the mirror? Thank you.